from the Supreme Court right now. Uh, we have an official report from the Supreme Court on the abortion draft ruling leak investigation. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to get Shannon Bream up on this in just a moment, John, but this is uh, just coming into us now. Uh, this says the marshal is reporting that the investigators continue to review and process some electronic data that has been collected and a few other inquiries remain pending. Yeah, oh, here, here's, here's, here's the crux. Investigators have found no forensic evidence indicating who disclosed the draft opinion. That's after 126 formal interviews of 97 employees, all of whom denied disclosing the opinion. Despite the efforts, investigators have been unable to determine at this time, using a preponderance of the evidence standard, the identity of the person or persons who disclosed the draft majority opinion in Dobbs v. Jackson. So, after all this investigation, they're no further along than they were. It sounds like it. Uh, Shannon Bream's <clears throat> uh, joining us now. Shannon, we're just getting a uh, first look at this. What can you tell us? Yeah, reading through it, and it's not an, a super long report, so it's about 20 plus or minus pages mm -hmm. that we're looking at. So what the court tells us is what we knew. The marshal, their internal leader of the court and of investigations there, had already undertaken this, but they also decided, something new we're learning, that they asked uh, Michael Chertoff, who was the former Homeland Security Secretary, he was a judge, to come in and also follow up on the marshal's investigation and do his own. And they said essentially what he found is that, based on his investigation, there's nothing additional he would have done besides what the marshal was doing and it leaves us at this place where they do give us now a definitive number of employees who could have had yep. access to that draft 82 people they say um, they say they followed up on all leads to this point they after their investigation Michael Chertoff coming in and also doing his investigation they've narrowed it but they haven't gotten to a name or a person now they say they are continuing to review and process some electronic data that has been collected and a few other inquiries remain pending so they say as far as those things, they're still sifting a few uh, through a few things. And if they find something there, the investigators will continue. So this is not over yet. But this is the first official word we've had from the court, even acknowledging what kind of investigation they were doing, giving us a little bit more details about what they did internally, then calling somebody in externally. And um, we don't have a name, but the investigation so continues. <laughs> so Shannon, in the absence of a, an obvious culprit, the best they can do uh, at the moment is to uh, try to change some protocols around the Supreme mm -hmm. Court. They're recommending specific measures, including restricting the distribution of hard copy versions of sensitive documents, restricting email distribution for sensitive documents, utilizing information rights management tools to better control how sensitive documents are used, edited, and shared, and then limiting the access of sensitive information on outside mobile devices. It, it, it is quite extraordinary to me that they have all of the, the uh, access to forensic evidence and weren't able to identify anybody, which means whoever leaked this draft opinion knew what they were doing. Mm -hmm. there, there are so many speculations that we can make. And first of all, there's been a long speculation about this, that somebody printed a hard copy and handed it off to a reporter. Even with that, though, based on what's, what how these documents are marked and tracked within the court, even from a printout, I'm told, if you had that hard copy, you would be able to narrow the scope of who would have printed it. Mm -hmm. The court does have its own internal sort of internet system and in that they can communicate on each other with each other on that system that does not connect to the outside. It doesn't go to the World Wide Web, to the internet as we know it. They have that internally. There are justices who like to do this longhand on legal pads and only like to um, distribute hard copies internally. So it is very old fashioned in some ways inside of the court, but even still, it didn't stop that breach. That was a once in a lifetime of the court, what happened last year. So they do have security in place. They are going to ramp up that security, but there are ways and people, if they want to be bad actors as far as maintaining the court's trust, um, are going to find ways around. It's happened once. The court wants to make sure it doesn't ever happen again. But keep in mind, as they say, they've been sifting through electronic data, other investigations. The clerks who serve at the court, who are closest to the work that the justices are doing, there are several of them per justice. They serve in a term that's generally July to July. So the, the clerks who were at the court, and we don't have any idea that it was a clerk, but you, that's part of the investigation and part of the normal logical process that you would want to weed through mm -hmm. them because they had such close access. Those clerks who were there when the Dobbs opinion was being drafted are gone. 
they've been gone since July. And many of them um, are fantastic Supreme Court producer. Bill Mears and I have been reporting that they were asked, many of them, to turn over phones, um, to turn over all kinds of information. Many of them lawyered up, and they mm -hmm. didn't do it. So there may yeah. be information that the investigations did not get to assess, whether right. it's the marshal or then the follow-up by former Judge Secretary Chertoff. Um, it's possible that those clerks left without ever giving access to that information, and they're long gone. So that's a part of the trail you just can't follow at this that point. That makes things kind of difficult.